This is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three. The top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of July 23rd, 2018. The weekly top three is a regular segment on the Michael Duke Show. I join Michael on the show each Tuesday morning from 9.15 to 10 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about the three issues. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 9 to 11 a.m. We post the podcasts of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, and SoundCloud pages, and on my website at bgkeithley.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, why there is a difference between Alaska first, Governor Walker's campaign themes, and Alaskans first and why that's important. Second, are we on track, as Mike Dunleavy claims in a recent op-ed, for, quote, a new Alaska legislature, which will look dramatically different next year, close quotes. And what's the consequence if that doesn't happen? And third, from a federal standpoint, even the Trump administration now admits we are headed for annual deficits of more than $1 trillion. What's the consequence of that? What does it mean to Alaskans, and what can we do about it? And now, let's join Michael. Blake. Brad Keithley joins us every week to discuss oil, gas, and the economic forecast of Alaska. It's the Michael Dukes Show. All right, that's a little quiet, but you heard it there. It's Brad Keithley here getting us all squared away, and he comes in every week to talk with us about his top three his top three are kind of the three biggest issues that he has uh, going up, uh, you know, going on around the state. And we're going to talk to him about that now. Good morning, Brad. How are you, my friend? Michael, I'm doing terrific this morning. How are you? I'm not doing too bad. Thanks for coming in and joining us. Uh, it's um, just a beautiful sunny day in Seattle. It's like 85 degrees already here. It's it's killing me. Um, but, uh, it, you know, I guess it's, I guess it's better than the alternative of 85 below. So we're okay with that. Um, you got some really good top. I was really looking forward to the show. You sent me some topics last night. I was kind of reading through it and looking at this and I will tell you right now, I'm kind of watching this whole thing and thinking this is the, we've got the possibility here during this election cycle of making some big changes and, and making a real difference. Um, but you wanted to start off with your top three as looking at the Walker campaign because obviously they've got the track record. They're here. They've done they've done three years worth of work already, and you want to look at the difference between his campaign in the beginning when he first ran for election and his campaign today. And I think there's some subtle but important differences here. I mean, they may be subtle on the surface, but I think there's an important underlying uh, thought process behind it. Let's talk a little bit about that. Yeah, there, there, there is. When Walker ran in 2014, his campaign uh, slogan was Alaska first. Um, and I think the uh, uh, that was sort of a, an emphasis on his LNG project and, and his LNG background, wanting to get, wanting to get the LNG uh, project uh, on track. I mean, he talked about being, you know, taking a ditch witch out there and started starting to dig the, the trench himself for the for the pipeline, and the Alaska first was let's I, I, the, the the theme of that slogan was uh, let, let's get Alaska back on track let's let's go develop our resources starting right. with uh, start starting with LNG. He's using the same slogan if you if you drive around Anchorage or in, or indeed the state. I happen to be up in Denali. Uh, uh, this week, and and I noticed it all the way uh, on the drive from Anchorage up. He's using the same slogan, Alaska first. But as I thought about it, and you have a lot of time when you take that four-hour drive <laughs> from Anchorage up to Denali. When I when I as I thought about it, uh, it's different. Uh, it's striking me as different this time, and and the and the impact on me is different. Um, I think there's a difference 
and 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 Walker's term, first term, has sort of revealed this. There's a difference, a subtle difference, going on between Alaska first and Alaskans first. Right. Alaska, Alaska first. The way Walker has, the way Walker and Malott have have done this first term, has sort of turned into state first, state government first, state government driven economy um, uh, first, uh, and that really comes out in the PFD cuts, right? Uh, it comes out in terms of, hey, we're not going to cut the budget anymore. I can't, I can't consciously cut the budget anymore. Alaskans want uh, all these services from state government. So we're going to maintain the budget. We're in deficit. We've been in deficit now for six years. Uh, the state went into deficit in 2014, deficit meaning we're spending more than we're taking in in revenue. Um, and and we're in deficit, so we got to do something about that. And and Walker uh, uh, fell for the Alaska Senate solution of cutting the PFD uh, instead of other ways to to raise revenue to deal with the deficit. Um, and but but it was find a way. I mean, Walker's the 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 theme of this first term is find a way to keep state government going at the levels that he wanted to keep it going. Um, and and develop the, and find the revenues to to, to fund that that, that continued use of government and it and it really um, uh, am I feeding back to you now, Brad? I'm sorry. Yeah, a little bit. I, and I apologize. I just somebody sent me a text and said we were getting no audio on the live stream, and I realized that it was because I didn't have something pressed. It's going to feed back to you slightly. I apologize. No, that's okay. Um, I, it, it, you know, people accuse me of wanting to listen to myself anyway. <laughs> well, I, uh, I've had to have that happen before, and sometimes I feel like I'm having a stroke when that's going on. Like I can't think and listen at the same time. So go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. But, well, but but so so all of this has been built around the first term has all been a build around build around state government first, uh, maintaining state government uh, as a priority over uh, everything else first. Alaska first. That to me, I mean, as I thought about it on the drive up and saw these signs, that that we have we have created a real split in these last four years over Alaska first, state government first, versus Alaskans first, because when when Walker uh, uh, looked to develop new revenues to keep state government uh, at the level he wanted to keep it at, what he did was pick the revenue source that has the largest adverse impact on the overall economy and has is by far the costliest to Alaska families. So he uh, cutting the PFD. So he picked a revenue source that hurt Alaskans right. and hurt the overall Alaska economy more than any other option, new revenue option he could have picked hurt Alaskans and the overall Alaskan economy to keep, to keep Alaska, the state government, uh, first, and that that I mean I, that to me is a real difference that has been created over the last four years. And frankly, I think his sign captures it, not to not to his advantage, uh, except for those who are tied to state government and want to keep state government at high spending levels. But but I think that really captures what what that four years has been. He has put Alaska state government first over Alaskans. Um, and I think that's a. I think that's a. That should be uh, a big issue in this campaign. Which goes first, Alaska, the state government, or Alaskans, uh, the seven hundred and fifty thousand people who populate the state? Well, because traditionally, I mean, let's face it, Alaska is. May, I mean, it's Alaskans are the ones that are supposed to hold the power. We are supposed to be. We are the state, right? I mean, we're an owner state in so many different ways. We're supposed to be the state. And, and yet, at this point, what he's done is he's basically gutted the private economy, which is really the driver. I mean, it, this is a, the interesting thing about this whole deal is because we are so uniquely suited in Alaska, because our revenues don't come from the citizenry as it does in most states. I mean, in most states, it's some form of taxation on the citizenry that fills the coffers of the state, and that's how they produce and, and, and produce the services and do the things. They don't really produce anything, but provide the services and everything else that they do. But in Alaska, because they bypass us in that whole equation, 
they really have no ramification and it just doesn't really seem that they give two cares about whether or not they damage the private economy as long as the public sector is running smoothly. That seems to be the goal of not just this administration, but quite honestly, the legislature as well. Well, the legislature, to me, Michael, that's that's part of the motivation for the legislature. Certainly, if you look at the Alaska House majority, uh, I think that, that the, which is composed largely of Democrats, uh, concerned about uh, their union members, uh, state government union members, uh, concerned about uh, public schools, the, the, the K-12 through system, and, and other things, state government oriented. That's certainly a big motivation on that side. The Alaska Senate, frankly, I think is motivated by something different. I think the Alaska Senate is motivated by two things. One is we can't get spending down any further. Either either we don't want to, either we like spending levels where they are, or we can't figure out a way to just cut the budget uh, and get it through the other body. So we can't get spending levels down any further. And then this is where I think the Alaska Senate uh, uh, goes off track. The Alaska Senate goes, well, we can't get spending down any further we agree we need new revenues because we can't afford this level of government uh, on the revenues we've got coming in. We've got to find some new revenues. And then this is where they go off trail. They say, okay, we don't want to tax the top 20%. Uh, I mean, uh, Senator Von Emhoff, in a, in a February interview with uh, the Alaska uh, or with the Anchorage uh, Daily News, May have still been the Alaska Dispatch then, but but whatever it was at that point, <laughs> in a February inter, in a February interview with uh, with Nat Hertz, let's just personalize it, um, said you know we can't we can't tax the top twenty percent, they'll leave, um, and so and so rather than do that, uh, uh, rather than you know hit all Alaskans proportionately across the board, rather than do that, the Alaska Senate went off the trail and, and decided that we're just going to take all this money from middle and lower income Alaskans uh, by cutting the PFD. So I think there's two different motivations uh, in the legislature. The governor's motivation, though, uh, I think is is clearly you know, aligns with the House motivation, which is we got to keep government uh, as big as we've built it because uh, it, you, you, we have all these jobs and we have uh, all these uh, people who are um, all these contractors, actually, but all these people who are who are dependent on on having big government spending. So it's it, there's different motivations going on, but it comes to the same same effect, right? It puts the state first uh, in, in in over the over the citizenry by by keeping government at the size it has become, and then grabbing revenue in the that has in the way that has the largest adverse impact on the overall economy and is by far the costliest to Alaska families, um, uh, has that has that impact, grabs revenue and, and keeps government going, but at the at the expense of the uh, at the expense of, of, of the private sector. I, I think if I were a candidate, frankly, um, I might make a huge deal out of this by by juxtaposing Walker's Alaska first signs with a sign that said Alaskans Alaskans first, right, uh, and put an emphasis on the N and the S, uh, because I think that's a real that's a real split. F- frankly, Michael, I think I think we're seeing uh, another Hickel Hammond election. Um, uh, some who, who who listen to the program may not have been around during that period. Um, I've I've immersed myself in history, so I could so I can understand it better. Uh, but I think we're seeing another split between uh, Hickel, who talked about the old Hickel, who talked about uh, the owner state and 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 maximizing the role of the owner state, and and Hammond, who when 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 we got into these issues would talk about the owner people, right, and the owner citizens, right, um, and that the Alaska Constitution was built for the owner citizens, not for the owner state. Uh, and and I, I think we're seeing another. I, I, I think we're seeing the exact same split uh, show up uh, in this election cycle. Well, I guess two things come to mind on this. First of all, I agree with you. I mean, if I was running this campaign, if I was running a campaign against Bill Walker, and right now, of course, we're in the primary, so the the candidates are trying to uh, play themselves off against their other opponents in the Republican side. And, and I guess if I was running the baggage campaign, and since he is pro PFD. 
um, I would be all over that. I mean, I would be hammering that at every opportunity that he, you know, basically kowtowed and caved to the special interests uh, in that regard. And then, of course, once we get into the general, whoever the candidate is, and I'm I'm hoping right now that it's going to be Mike Dunleavy, that he just beats that tune to death uh, because I think that's what people identify with and people understand. I have been interviewing various politicians at different levels, state uh, uh, legislature for the House and the Senate, uh, lieutenant governor candidates, governor candidates, and in almost all the responses when I say, what are the people telling you when you knock door to door? And they're saying their big issues are the PFD and crime um, and the economy, but I think that ties back into both of them. But PFD and the crime are the two big issues. And so if I was either one of the opponents of Bill Walker, I would be absolutely beating the hell out of this, which, again, takes me back to my second part of this question. And maybe I need you to slip onto the couch here or maybe I slip onto the couch and you play Dr. Freud on this. But, I mean, I've known Bill Walker for years. Um, I supported him in his first run. This is not the Bill Walker that I remember. This is not the guy that I know that, you know, is this bigger government, protect government at all costs. I mean, is there an underlying reasoning behind this? Is it because he had to pay back and kowtow to the people that got him elected so that he could get the gas line going? I mean, that was really Bill's whole thing from the time that I first talked to him about running for office and everything else. His whole point and his whole goal was to get a gas line in Alaska to, to help benefit the people. That was really what it was about for him was benefiting the people so that they could have access to uh, you know, to the to the to the gas as well as the export, but it was also so that you know people in Fairbanks could have access to cheap energy. I mean, so that they, all these things would be available. I, I just don't know. I, I'm trying to figure out exactly how he slipped the lit, slipped the leash, so to speak, and has ended up in this direction. What are your thoughts? Well, I yeah, this is sort of getting on the couch or somebody getting on the couch. Here, here's my thought. And I've walked, I've watched the Walker administration closely. Um, uh, and you know, some people recall that I was the first speaker at the first transition committee, uh, uh, meeting that Walker had in December of, uh, of 2014. He wanted somebody to talk about the state of, of, of the budget. And, uh, and, and I was the person that did it. And, and it was, uh, or, or one of the people that did it. And it was, a uh, um, I mean, I was fairly close to Walker. I talked to him during the campaign. Here's where I think it went off track. I think I think when Walker got into government and and started looking at the budget and and, and remember, oil prices dropped during the 24 cam- 2014 campaign. And at the end of the 2014 campaign, uh, as you get into December and January, you're looking at, at mu- a much different revenue picture for the state uh, than you'd looked at uh, than you'd looked at previously. Um, and Walker's sitting there, and at some point, somebody came to him and said, Governor, you're going to have to sign a bunch of pink slips to lay people off right. um, in, in, in order to, in order to get, get spending down to the level that it needs to get down to. And then, you know, various people said, well, you can't lay off enough people and, and, all, and all sorts of things <laughs> like that. Right, right. There, there was a way out of this problem. If, you, if we would have cut government down, we had enough savings at that point to sort of glide our way through uh, uh, a, a significant drop in revenues over a prolonged period, uh, and uh, but you had to start you had to start cutting government costs. And I think I think the come to Jesus moment for for Walker was when he was confronted with those pink slips. You know, if you look at, at Walker's business history, he was a lawyer largely, right. um, and and law firms are fairly small, and you know lawyers come and go. You really don't have to sign a lot of pink slips. Uh, when you're when you're leading a law firm, particularly when it's a family law law firm like like Bill's was, um, and I think I think it was that moment. You and I both know Bill. We both know he's the, he he can be emotional. I think it was that moment when he had to confront uh, the consequences of of the layoffs he was going to have to do that he that he blinked and said, "I'm not going to do it." Now I think Byron plays a role in that. I think uh, Randy Hoffbeck. I think others play a role in that. Uh, but I think that's the moment at which at which Bill blinks, and 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 once you do that, once you say I'm not going to sign those pink slips, I'm going to keep those people employed, um, I'm going to keep you know state government uh, at the same size, then you then you put yourself on an entirely different route, and the route you put yourself on is you have to worry about revenue. I mean, right. the state's down. Yes, we got savings, but we're going through savings at a blistering pace. You've got to worry about revenue at that point. And then you've got Ron Duncan with GCI, 
who's coming out and saying, oh, everybody wants to, everybody would support PFD cuts. It's a good thing. Everybody will make the sacrifice <laughs> uh, without really looking. <laughs> It would be a good sacrifice for Ron Duncan because, yeah. you know, as a top 20 percenter, a top 10 percent, hell, a top 5 percenter, right. Duncan wouldn't have to pay taxes <laughs> right. with, with PFD cuts. Uh, but not a good deal for the overall Alaska economy. And 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 then the Senate uh, essentially says, we're not going down the, we're not going to let you get away with taxes. We're going to refuse to do taxes. PFD cuts, though, doesn't impact our constituents, our, our, you know, our, our donor base. So go ahead and do them. Right. Um, and, and, and he sort of slides on down, slides on down that road. Uh, yeah. I think, I think if Walker were running, if he, if he hadn't been elected in 2014, if he were running today, uh, I think he'd be much more like Mike, Mike Dunleavy than he is, but he got, he got himself into this trap when he wouldn't sign the pink slips, uh, when he wouldn't make that cut. And, uh, and that just, that just sent him down an entirely different road. Yeah, and I and I, I see that, and I and I'm 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 disheartened a little bit by it, like I said, because I was there with Bill and I supported him, and I thought that, you know, his plans were good, but I guess the best laid plans, you know, of mice and men, et cetera, et cetera. Um, let's talk a little bit about the about the 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 race going forward, and the outcome. Um, even if we paint the best case scenario, and Mike Dunleavy had an opinion piece in the ADN, which I thought was pretty good. I thought because there's been some criticism that he um, he's calling for cuts but not really talking about it. So he laid out a few ideas that he had for what cuts could be made. Um, I thought that they were I thought that they were fairly good uh, ideas. Uh, but he also talked about the makeup and change in the legislature. What are your thoughts on Dunleavy's piece, and how does that affect the new legislature that he says? I, as I'm, as I was reading through Dunleavy's piece, there's one sentence that just caught my eye and, and made me sort of jolt. Uh, the sentence basically is, uh, we will have a, a, a new legislature, a new legislature, which will look dramatically different next year. Uh, that was part of the assumptions that he laid in, uh, as in the piece, as he was talking about, uh, his plan going forward, that he would be dealing with a new legislature, right. which will look dramatically different next year. Now, you and I have talked about why that's important to have a new legislature. The legislature, the governor can't add appropriations. So if the, so if the, legis, if the legislature came in and said, we're cut, given the Supreme Court case last year, the legislature came in and said, we're cutting the PFD, uh, and that's, that's all we're going to send up to you uh, is, a, is a reduced PFD, the governor can't add any additional money. He can't make it into... Uh, he can't make the PFD higher than what the legislature appropriates. So you and I have talked on the show about how critically important these legislative races are uh, and how critically important it is to, to, to get a legislature in there that will be supportive uh, of the governor's, of, if Dunleavy is elected, of, of the governor's agenda of getting the PD, PFD back up to, uh, to the full amount uh, 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 contemplated by statute. Um, but here's the thing: we're we're less than thirty days out from the primary, and I'm not sure I see uh, the same the, have the same view of this new legislature uh, that will be uh, dramatically different uh, as Dunleavy. I see the potential for that. Right. Uh, I mean, you got you got Ron Gillum running against Peter Macecki, uh down in the uh, down in the Kenai, Macecki. Uh, has all along he he was among the first to, to jettison the PFD and say I'd get cut it that's that's right. the way we're going to deal with this issue. Ron Gillum is a candidate who has uh, continually been supportive of paying a full PFD uh, and uh, and accommodating that through other changes uh, to government. So I see the potential there are candidates out there uh, that can do that sort of thing uh, in the in 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 West Anchorage. Uh, uh, Sarah Rasmussen, a, a new rising young, bold uh, conservative, is trying to take on Jason Gren. Uh, Jason Gren uh, has been someone who's been out there in front of cutting the PFD, preserving state government as it is. I see the potential uh, for that to do, but but for 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 Sarah Rasmussen to get to the general election against Jason Gren, she has to get through a contested prize primary with Liz Vasquez. Uh, and I'm not, you know, that 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 election is in uh, uh, is, is sort of in flux. So I see the potential out there to have this new legislature, uh, but I, it's far from certain. And if we don't have that new legislature, just sort of like uh, uh, 
Mike Dunleavy's piece sort of falls apart if you don't if you don't take that assumption as as one of the bricks. Um, uh, sort of, you know, the vision for how the state works out under a Dunleavy administration, I think, uh, becomes becomes more difficult. So that was a key sentence. I, I was really I was really intrigued to see that in the Dunleavy piece, um, uh, and uh, and and it's not one uh, it's not one I've heard him talk about on the campaign trail. Uh, it's not one I've seen him talk about in other uh, pieces or in other situations. And frankly, it's not one I've seen him out there trying to push. I've not seen him endorsing candidates, legislative candidates, or pushing for legislative candidates that will help him make these changes. Uh, if he wanted, if, if that's a key piece, if I were him, I would be out there pushing uh, candidates. As 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 difficult as it as it might be, I'd be looking at uh, a Ron Gillum, and I'd be looking at at ways to help bolster Gillum's campaign against Machecki, because Machecki's going to be a problem. Uh, if Dunleavy's elected governor, Machecki's going to be a problem uh, in dealing with uh, in dealing with the issues that Dunleavy's going to have to deal with. So interesting, interesting line in the Dunleavy piece, an important, critical part of, of, of his success as a governor. Uh, but I think that piece is, right now as we sit less than 30 days out from the primary, uh, I don't see that piece being a being a given. I see it a, being a, a a substantial question mark. To be honest, we talked with Gillum yesterday, and he, you know, he did talk a little bit about you know that there's thirty something incumbents being challenged at this point, which I mean I think is a great number. Uh, I'm not I'm not uh, convinced that they're necessarily going to you know make all the changes or get the traction. And that's a little disappointing to me, quite honestly. Um, and and I mean, as much as I would like to see, um, as much as I would like to see Dunleavy's prediction come true, I don't know. I mean, do you want to you want to throw money down on this and tell me what you know what your thoughts are as far as uh, <laughs> you know? And tell me what your thoughts are as far as whether or not we're going to actually be um, you know be be able to see that that amount of changes. Well. I have thrown money down in the sense of campaign contributions. Yes, the the new numbers the new numbers are out, and people can go to the APOC and see where I've thrown money. But uh, but in terms of a big bet that the legislature changes, um, if we were talking about betting a significant amount of my savings, I wouldn't be I wouldn't be uh, or my investments I wouldn't be putting that bet down right now. I I see the candidates that can do it. I see the Don Joneses. Uh, that's, that's running against Lance Pruitt. I see the Sarah Raspison, uh that's running against uh, 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 Jason Grant. I see the, the Ron Gillum that's running against uh, Peter Machecki. Uh, I see the Sarah Vance that's running against uh, 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 Paul Seaton. Uh, Paul Seaton. Yeah. I, I, I see these candidates that can do it, uh, can, can make a difference, but I don't see that they have, that, that, that all of them are going to get through uh, and I see all of them having challenges. I mean, Machecki, you go down to the Kenai, uh, and Machecki's got a lot of signs out. Uh, uh, and he's got a lot of support down there. And, and it's just, it's gonna be, it's gonna be a real, it, it, it's gonna be a real hump for Ron Killam to, to overcome and win that case. I hope he does. I've contributed to him. I hope others contribute to him. Um, and I hope others support him. But it's gonna be a real hump. Uh, for, for, for for Ron to win that race, Sarah needs financial support to win her race. I mean, uh, Sarah Vance, both Sarah, Sarah Rasmussen and Sarah Vance need financial support to win their races. So it's, I see the candidates uh, that are that, that can get this done. Uh, I just don't see an absolutely clear path uh, to success, though. Yeah, and and I think that's going to be the challenge. So game this out for me then. If Mike Dunleavy does get in there and the legislature is well, I mean, let's just say essentially unchanged. I think there's going to be a few changes, um, but I mean, let's just say that it's essentially unchanged for it now. What do you foresee that being if a Mike Dunleavy gets in and he's facing the same? He has the same kind of plans, the same kind of things he wants to do, but he's facing a legislature that is reticent to take on any of these tasks that he's talked about. I see. I see the potential for a lot of special sessions, Michael. And and here's here's what I see playing out. The legislature. I mean, not only shown his card that he wants a full PFD. That's his, that's most of his campaign. If he's elected, he's been elected with a mandate. 
uh, uh, the people who voted for him are expecting him to deliver on that. We get to January, the legislature comes in, I see Dunleavy's budget having a full PFD. Um, and, and, you know, and he'll propose a constitutional amendment, as he's talked about, that will get shuffled off to some committee and never heard from again. He, fought, he, he proposes the full PFD. The, the, the legislature sits there and goes, huh, he wants a full PFD. Well, we want spending on this and that and the other thing. Um, and so here's, here's what we're going to do, Mr. Governor. Here's our budget, uh, which breaks the bank. Um, here's our budget. Um, and maybe we'll let you have a full PFD if you agree to our budget. Don Levy says no. Um, I'm, I'm going to, you know, I will veto everything that you send me, but it's over $3.75 billion. That's my cap. Uh, my spending cap. You can do whatever you want to inside of $3.75 billion, but that's my spending cap, and I'm line-eyed and vetoing proportionately across the board, let's say, everything above $3.75 billion. Legislature goes, fine, you're not getting your PFD. In fact, what we're going to do is we're going to take the PFD down to 25% uh, instead, of the, instead of the 33% that we came up with this year, and if you don't play ball with this, we may take it down to 15%. And guess what? Uh, uh, Mr. Governor, Governor, we got, got elected in our districts, districts. sort of like sort of like Seton, right? I mean, you, 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 so, so far we've not been able to we've not been able to blast Seton out of that district. district. So, so you, you got, got you got Pete Kelly, Kelly you got Peter Bichecki, uh, who, who who will, will have been reelected re if he's there. And they'll all say, yeah, we, we got reelected. Re we cut the PFD. We got reelected. And so we just end up in this in this deadlock of the legislature not giving him not appropriating the full PFD. Dunley be not agreeing to to whatever spending the legislature is coming up with. Nobody coming up with how to fund it alternatively. If you do have those higher uh, spending levels, other than the legislature, which will keep saying cut the PFD, and and I see 2019 being a very long year uh, uh, for the legislature. The other thing that comes into effect is the law that says they don't get per diem after the 120 days. I don't know what the hell tax does. Uh, but it, but I see I see 2019 being a very, very difficult year if Dunleavy doesn't have if Dunleavy is elected and we don't have a different legislature. Yeah, and and I I foresee that as well. I mean that's kind of what I've been planning on because again, like you, I don't see a lot of traction. I mean the the power of the incumbency in this in this case is so huge. Uh, I'm just not sure what's going to happen. And and a lot of these candidates, I my hat is off to each and every one of them. But at the same time, I worry that we're just not going to have the we're not going to have the effect that we hope on a lot of these uh, on a lot of these issues. Um, so we'll have to I guess we'll keep an eye on it here. Yeah, it's, it's, we're going to tell we're going to know a lot after after the primary. Did Sarah Rasmussen get through? Did she get through with enough of a momentum to be able to take on Jason Grant? Did Sarah Vance get through? Did she get through with enough momentum to be able to take on Paul Seaton? Did Ron Gillum get through? Uh, did Don Jones get through against Lance Pruitt? I mean, there's going to be certain key races where you're going to be able to tell. And then, if Dunleavy wins the primary, in my opinion, he needs to, for, the, for whoever survives, Dunleavy needs to make this a package deal. It's not only elect me as governor, but elect these legislators with me. Because if I don't get them, the legislature is going to frustrate me. I, 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 see, I see the fall being a full-on package race uh, uh, with Dan Levy as the, as the leader of the pack. Uh, if we don't have that, if Mike's elected without a legislature that's supportive of him, it's just, it's just going to be a very difficult 2019. Yeah, and, and I guess that's my main fear is that he does get in, and yet we still have all these challenges um, where he becomes ineffectual because he doesn't have enough support to make all that happen. That I, I would agree that that is, at this point, my biggest concern um, as well. Uh, Brad Keithley is our guest. We're talking with him about uh, the state of the state, what's going to be happening with the elections and more. He uh, joins us this morning, and we're going to be continuing this discussion. That was number two of, our, of Brad's top three. Every week he has top three things that he thinks are important to the state of Alaska. And we've got uh, those three things to tackle. We've done the first two, and now we're on to number three, which is the uh, on a broader issue, the national budget. And we're talking specifically now about the tax cuts and all these things that were touted. But even Donald Trump is now saying, well, wait a second, um, we have a problem. 
uh, this budget now is creating some deficits that may not be good. Yeah, at the time, at the time that in December of last year when we passed the tax cut, um, uh, the Trump administration said we're going to grow the, the, the tax cuts, going to grow the economy, it's going to have supply side effects. We're ultimately going to produce more revenues. Uh, than we would have produced with the higher tax rates because economic growth is going to be so great, uh, income growth is going to be so great. We're going to have we're going to have higher revenues. Two things happened. Uh, two things have happened since that. Uh, one is in February and then in March, the, the Congress passed a huge budget bill. Uh, it was we ended up with more defense spending than the administration had asked. Even the administration had asked for. We ended up with more non-defense uh, uh, discretionary spending uh, than than anybody had asked for. Uh, as they put together the coalition necessary to to pass the budget bill, it was sort of like anybody who wanted more money uh, in order to get a vote uh, got it. Uh, and so the, the total uh, was much the sum was much bigger than than what any individual had asked for because right. individuals had said I, I want more spending here I'm willing to take less there they sort of they sort of trashed all of the less there and they just they gave all the more there um, and 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 growth has been significant but it hasn't produced the type of additional new revenues uh, that I think uh, well certainly the administration forecast so in February when the administration came out with its proposed uh, uh, 2019 fiscal year 2019 budget. Uh, the administration uh, 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 predicted that we that that the, we'd still have a deficit, but the deficit would be in the range of 800 million, 800 billion dollars. That's right, right federal right. level now. It's billion, 800 billion dollars. Um, then we've had these events uh, since then. Each year, uh, about six months in. The administration, or six months in, the to, to a budget year, the administration is required to produce what's called a mid-session review, uh, where they sort of update uh, the budget numbers uh, that they originally came up with. It's the equivalent uh, in Alaska of what we have in Alaska, which is the spring forecast. We have the fall revenue forecast uh, on which the initial uh, budget is is uh, based, and then we have a spring revenue forecast. Uh, that, that comes out right before the budget is finalized. Um, the, the congressional equivalent or the, the D.C. equivalent is to have this mid-session review. And in the mid-session review, for the first time, uh, the Trump administration, the, the Office of Management and Budget, uh, has, has now pegged uh, the deficit that the nation is going to run in FY 2019, and indeed a couple of years beyond that, at more than a trillion dollars. <laughs> now, the... The, the administration still claims that the that the deficit is going to come down after that as growth, economic growth catches up, uh, sort of delayed reaction, but as economic growth uh, catches up, and and they predict that beyond 2020, FY 2020, when you get into FY 2021, you'll start having um, uh, uh, the, the, the deficit numbers still high. We'll still have a deficit, but the deficit numbers will be coming down. But most people. Almost everybody else who's looked at it, Congressional Budget Office, the nonpartisan independent watchdog uh, uh, associations that are out there, most of those say that that's not going to happen, uh, that it, in, if, for, if for no other reason than continued growth and spending, uh, particularly on the mandatory side, uh, we're going to continue to run uh, trillion-dollar-plus deficits. The administration's finally come around and admitted that with respect to 2019. That that has, and, and FY 2020, that has huge implications. I mean, it means it means that everybody, everybody, everybody uh, is now admitting that our national debt or national deficit is spiraling out of control. One trillion dollars is a huge amount of money. Uh, we had we had deficits of that size when we were in the Great Recession. In the, in the first Obama administration, but by 2012 we had that corrected. We, we'd come out of the out of the Great Recession to some degree. Uh, there had been a, a spending reductions, and from 2012 to 2016, the second term of the Obama administration, deficits were were coming down. And in fact, had it not been for this for the tax bill and the spending bill, the deficit for FY 2019 would be less than 500 billion dollars we'd be we'd be well on the way to getting it back toward uh, getting it under control but now we've spiraled out of control 
uh, again, and um, and has huge implications for for not only government but for the overall economy and certainly for future uh, uh, Americans. What I'm amused by here, in a kind of morbid way, is the parity between what's going on at the national level and what's going what we just talked about at the state of Alaska level. I mean, it's the same kind of thing. If you want to get this, we have to have that. It's the quid pro quo that seems to be pervading our political process. Where, you know, yeah, you can have cuts to this or you can have your spending over here, but to do that, I have spending over here. I mean, we all know what the answer is. The bottom line is, is that there's not enough revenue flowing in into the federal coffers for all the spending that they're doing. And it's even more exaggerated at the federal level than it is at the state level. But, I mean, it's a, just this tremendous amount of spending and nobody is willing to talk about reducing it i mean you have the rand pauls the thomas masseys the mike lees there's a few in there that have you know made some squawks and tried to put some plans forward but they're basically ignored and the republicans and the democrats lock arms hold hands and jump off the cliff together in this way and they're just it's just a spend it's a spending spree essentially at the federal level it it, it is it's parochialism it's parochialism versus versus a national picture. I, you know, if Trump was asked during the 2016 campaign um, uh, what his view on the budget was, what his view on the budget deficit was, and in an in an interview with the Washington Post, uh, Trump said, "I can get the budget down to zero, or I can get the deficit down to zero uh, uh, inside of eight years, um, and and cut spending and and achieve and and that that national view." Uh, frankly, if you pull it as a national view, I think it's I think it's a widely held view that that's something that we ought to do. Right. The problem is it's when you, it's when you get down to the parochialism. I mean, so you've got uh, for good reason. Uh, Dan Sullivan says, "Well, we can't cut defense spending. We have to maintain defense spending." Lisa says, "Well, we have to maintain domestic spending uh, in Alaska. Uh, you go to Kentucky. You go to Georgia. You go to Texas. You go to Maine." Everybody, everybody's got their own parochial thing that the federal government has done that they want to maintain. And then the thing that the thing that we're going to have to address, uh, mandatory spending, the, the combination of Social Security, uh, Medicare and Medicaid, um, nobody wants to touch that. I mean, yeah. the, from an overall concept, yes, we've got to get the deficit down. Yes, we've got to get back to something approaching a balanced budget. But the details, the, the parochialism you generate when you get into the details, is just is stifling. I mean, you can't get I, the 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 spending bill in February and March was just a great example. I mean, it was if if you want that, if 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 you want uh, if, if if we're going to get a bill uh, and you want that, then we're going to have to give Joe that. We're going to get have to get Sarah that. We're going to have to get Lisa that. Um, and you know, Lisa and and Dan were in there for their for their. For their own constituencies, Dan wanted increased uh, defense spending. He wanted uh, missiles in Alaska, all for good reason. Lisa wanted, uh, you know, Lisa wanted uh, uh, Medicaid protected, all for good reason. Right. Uh, but you can't, you can't have everything. You can't have it all. Uh, right. And 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 get, and get your budget under control. Right. Well, and I think the biggest thing is is that what we're really not seeing, and it's mentioned in this article from the Committee for Responsible Federal Government is that they mentioned in, in the analysis of this mid, 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 midterm review that, uh, one of the, that one of the biggest contributors to this, to this, uh, this increase, this, this you know, higher than intigi- the originally anticipated increase, is a lot of mandatory outlays, and most of it is in the form of debt service. I mean, we are literally still yep. paying on money that we borrowed eons ago, and that number just continues to increase because we're borrowing more and more. I mean, it'll get to the point to where we're just servicing the debt, let alone providing services for the people of the country. Yeah, it's the the, the, the numbers in that regard are staggering. I publish them from time to time in in what I call the the our daily uh, uh, fix the debt factoid. Uh, but the numbers are staggering. Uh, interest is it will be by 2028. Interest will be 13 percent of federal spending. 13 percent. That counts everything. Counts Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, defense spending, uh, uh, non defense uh, disc- uh, discretionary spending. Interest will be 13 percent of total federal spending. It is the fastest rising category of federal spending out there. It will exceed the size 
of the defense budget by 2024. I may have these numbers wrong, but it's certainly within the next 10 years. Exceed the size of the defense budget by 2024. Exceed the size of the of the non-defense discretionary spending uh, by uh, 2022 or something something of that nature. Uh, and, and and you know starts starts crowding up against Medicare Medicaid right. uh, as 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 uh, a size, as terms of size of of spending it is it is huge and and that's assuming Michael assuming interest rates stay roughly in the two percent level if interest rates spike uh, as as you know as as we're beginning to see uh, the Fed think about uh, because of the state of the economy. Uh, if interest rates spike up higher than that, interest becomes even higher because we have to pay interest uh, uh, on uh, interest at higher rates on the debt. So it's um, yeah, it's amazing. I mean, we're taking money, we're taking money from future Americans, their tax dollars that that they're giving uh, in their lives in order to make their lives better, in order to in order to uh, sustain government at levels that they think is important. Uh, we're taking tax dollars from them to pay off interest from from debt generated by prior generations. To them, it's debt. To future Americans, it's dead money. It's not doing them any good. It's just paying off, you know, the credit mom and dad's credit card uh, when mom and dad were out on a spending binge right. uh, and uh, and and stuck the kids with the bill. And that's just interest. That's not that's not paying that's down the principle. debt. Yeah, that's, that's not, not reducing the na- national <laughs> debt. That's just interest on the, on the credit card. Just servicing the interest. Have a nice day. I mean, you know, good, <laughs> good luck getting to that principle one day. Your your children's children's children might get to it if we stopped it right now. You know, but that, that's the problem. And nobody's willing to make that hard call. That's the worst part. We're seeing the same thing in Alaska. Nobody's willing to make the hard call and be the bad guy and say, "Hey, we have to stop." We have to stop now if we want to if we want to pull you got to pull the brakes. It's like the train. You got to pull the brakes way before you hit the end of the bridge. Well, it's like we could see the bridge coming and nobody has the guts to pull on the brakes. And that's the worst part. Yeah, exactly right. And so, you know, in Alaska, we've gone six years of deficit spending. I, when I when I say that to people, they sort of, you know, look at me oddly. But but revenues have not have not equaled sp- expenditures since the since fiscal year 2014 we we are we are six years 2014 15 16 17 18 and now 19 we're six years um of of deficit spending uh, okay yes you know and the other side of the equation is this michael people don't want to talk about it. the other side of the equation is this yes uh, we should be cutting spending yes uh, there are, are places to do it. Yes, there are people who know how to do it. Yes, there are decisions that could be made to do it. But for par- parochial reasons, uh, uh, individual legislators, as we saw at the national level in February, March, legislators just won't come together to do it. So you know what the solution has to be, right? Uh, uh, spending exceeds revenue. We're going deeper and deeper into debt. We're generating uh, these interest costs out there in the future. We're going to have to raise revenue. Right. And, 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 and we're going to have to have to balance it out that way because nobody's willing to make the cuts. But then everybody goes, oh, no, don't raise revenue. We can make these cuts. But we haven't made the cuts in six years. Yeah. Well, but we can make them. Yeah. <laughs> but we haven't done it. Sounds a lot like lip service to me, that's for sure. Brad Keithley's our guest. He's with Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Brad, let's wrap up here. Final thoughts as we get through your top three for today. I mean, what do we do? I mean, what do we, you know, I mean, this is the thing. We could talk about these issues. You and I talk about them all the time, and I don't want people to necessarily feel just kind of frustrated. We've got to have some kind of call to action here to give people a plan to be able to to do something with the info that we're dropping. We're, we're basically force-feeding them with a fire hose here. Well, I, I, think, I think that one of the things we can do, and the most important thing we can do in the next 30 days, is take Dunleavy just words. Uh, Dunleavy says to, to accomplish what he wants to do, he needs a new legislature, which will look dramatically different next year. We need to take him at his word. We need to have that new legislature that will look dramatically different uh, next year. We need to have the Sarah Rasmussen's, the Ron Gillums, the Sarah Vance's, the Don Jones's. Uh, we need to have that new blood, the William Weatherby's out in the uh, out in Western Alaska, who's taking on Bryce Edgman. We need to have that new blood. We need to give him the new legislature he needs in, in order to accomplish his objective. So what, what's, the, what's the top 
thing that everybody ought to be doing. They ought to be looking, frankly, at their whole card. Who can they contribute to? Uh, who can they, you know, help develop the financial resources ne necessary to, to generate the new legislature? And who can they help by, by talking to their friends, uh, walking with the candidate, uh, talking on social media about the candidate, writing letters to the editor? Who can you help? that will produce that new legislature. That's the most important thing. You know, we talked in the first segment about it's Alaskans first, not Alaska first, Alaskans first. We need people talking about that, uh, particularly in the next 30 days. Yeah. We need to get candidates in office who can, who can provide that sort of support. If we don't have them, no matter what we do for governor, if we don't have the legislature lined out to be able to be supportive of making these spending cuts, uh, and, and, and keeping things like the PFD whole, uh, then we're just going to, you and I are going to keep talking about these issues, you know, for the next four or five years. And it's going to be 11 years of deficit at right. some point, as opposed to six years of deficit. That's, that's the key thing. And you got 30 days left to do it. Yep, absolutely. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. You can find his uh, you can find his page at the top of my page here where we've got the video. I've got a link to his Facebook page. That's a great place to go for that information. And, of course, you can uh, follow him out there and on Twitter and get all the details of things that you need to do. Brad Keithley, thanks so much, my friend, for being part of it today. We appreciate you joining us on the program, as always. Michael, thanks for having me, as always. I look forward to it. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the Weekly Top 3 from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube and SoundCloud pages and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.